good morning, Harvest. How are we doing this morning? Doing good? Let's stand. It's great to be in the house of the Lord this morning, isn't it? Yeah? Well, hey, we're going to worship our God and Savior this morning. And let's just do it with all of our heart, yeah? Sound good? Come on. Come on, we sing this. We worship the God. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds a victory. Come on. There's joy. same spirit, why don't you turn to someone next to you and just greet them this morning.
have been seen By the grace of God, amen, I have been raised To a future without end, I set my eyes On a true and loyal friend The one whose life I'm hidden in Sing Jesus All my hope in Jesus A love that never leaves us You won't forsake us now Oh Jesus Faithful through the ages Of all church isn't God good yeah I want to read this scripture over us this morning it's in Hebrews 4 starting verse 15 it says this high priest of ours understands our weaknesses for he faced all the same testings we do yet he did not sin so let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God there we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most you know, as we, as we were planning our, our, the songs that we were singing this, this morning, um, we're about to introduce a new song, and I was just thinking through, you know, what does our church need to hear? And I, and I was thinking even more, I was like, what do I need to hear? And I was reminded of the fact that there are so many times where I'm, 
I'm struggling in my sin or I'm struggling um, drawing near to God and I'm realizing that, that all he requires of me is like, to take a step forward. All he requires of me is to come near to him where I can receive mercy, where I can receive grace. And so as we sing this song, it's called Run to the Father. Um, can that just be our, our prayer this morning that instead of, uh, instead of falling back uh, whenever times are tough and instead of falling back whenever we sin, can we actually just commit to the Lord that we are gonna run towards him? Can we commit that we're gonna be bold in our faith to seek after God even when times are tough? Can we do that this morning? Let's sing this.
this morning as we are remembering who you are and what you've done for us. 
Can we just have spirits of boldness, spirits of peace come over us? Can your Holy Spirit give us a peace that surpasses all understanding? We pray these things in your precious and holy name. Amen. It's good to be together for worship this morning. Why don't you go ahead and take a seat? Well, welcome everybody to worship this morning. Uh, my name is Dave and I serve as one of the pastors here. I want to take a moment and uh, we want to try to get all of our first time guests to come forward, stand at the front, say your name. No, that'd be silly. But we're really glad that it, you're here. Uh, we love it when people visit. I know for a fact we have visitors from Arizona and Virginia and Denver in the room today. So why don't you see if you can find somebody you don't know today before you leave and greet them. Maybe you're local and visiting. If this is your first time or you're here recently for the first time, we'd love to just say hello, answer questions you might have. So right after this service, I'm going to go out to the welcome table in the lobby, and I hope to get a chance to meet you if we haven't yet met. For everybody, every week we have a thing called the Connect Card, and it's digital, and and it is available through the Harvest Bible Chapel app. It's also available uh, on the QR codes. You can use your phone and just check in. Why? Because we're a church family, because we love to know that you're here, because we want to know how we can pray. And uh, so our staff each week prays through every prayer request. So I would encourage you to check in today and each time that you're here together for worship. Hey, we are uh, a couple of days from Thanksgiving which is wonderful. What a great opportunity to really praise the Lord, thank Him, be with family and friends. But I know how you are. You're like, I'm already looking at Christmas. What's happening with Christmas and the dates and the services and how's that fall? And so I want to give you all that information right now so that you can plan ahead. Uh, it's a great month to invite someone to come with you to church. Uh, so here it is. Saturday nights will be the same every Saturday in December, 5 p.m. So that's easy, right? And uh, the Sundays, the first three weekends will be normal, 9 a.m., 11 a.m. As we get to Christmas Eve on the 24th, Sunday we're going to do one service. So that'll be 10 a.m. on the 24th. There will also be on the 24th a 5 p.m. candlelight service. Now those services are different. So if you're super eager or have nowhere to go, you can be here all day. All right, But uh, two services, 10 a.m., 5 p.m. on Christmas Eve. And then on the 31st, we'll have, again, one Sunday morning service at 10 a.m. And uh, we just want you to know that. Now, here's the thing, guys. This is a great time when people are thinking about things of the Lord. And so uh, we have available invitation cards. They're on the tables in the lobby. Uh, it talks about Christmas. It's got all of the different things I just said about service times. And uh, the, the uh, sermons for December will be on the theme of what does Christmas tell us about God? So it's really a perfect opportunity to bring someone with you. Pray about that, consider it, and we're looking forward to worshiping together in December. We're going to pray in a moment. We're going to pray today for Willow Creek Community Church as we've been praying for local churches. Uh, so very many people have come to faith in Jesus Christ through Willow Creek, and we praise the Lord for that. Uh, we want to pray for their campus pastor, Sean Williams, of the South Barrington campus, and just that the Lord would use them mightily. We also have the opportunity to give. And uh, why would we give? Well, the short answer is because God is worthy. He's worthy of our first. He's worthy of our best. We took the first part of the first day of the week to come and worship him. That's right. Now, we've sung the songs from our heart. We're going to lean into the word in just a moment. But our giving should also reflect that. He's worthy. And so, uh, from Scripture, Proverbs 3, Honor the Lord with your possessions and the first produce of your entire harvest. That's such an opportunity for us every time. Lord, you're worthy. Let it be shown in the way I sing, in the way I listen, in the way I give, in the way I serve. So if you want to be a part of that, there's digital opportunities for giving. You'll see those on the screens. And there's a couple of blue boxes on the walls back here. But this is so much a heart thing. I don't give to check a box. I don't give to earn somebody's favor. I give because God is worthy. And so now we want to pray together and then uh, continue on in our service. Let's all pray. Lord, we commit this time to you. Thank you that we have this opportunity to be in your house on the first day, the first morning of the week. We want to give the best to you because you are worthy. So, Lord, in the way we serve you, be honored. 
in the way we sing, be praised. In the way we listen, Lord, you deserve all of the glory. And as we give, it's a joy because you've given all things to us. Lord, now we commit the rest of this service to you. We want to pray for our friends at Willow Creek Community Church, Lord. Would you bless them? Would you help them? Would you continue to shine brightly the gospel of Jesus Christ through everything they do? And Lord, now we lean into your word. We want to hear from you. Do what you want done through this word today, we pray. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen, amen. All right, well, why don't you get your Bible ready, digital or paper or whatever, Acts chapter 16. And in just a moment, we're gonna lean into God's word together. Good morning, everybody. Happy Thanksgiving. A little bit early, but uh, I know you're looking forward to it like what Pastor Dave said. And can I just encourage you on this Thanksgiving week to really focus your attention on the goodness of the Lord because it never fails. He is such a great God and worthy of our praise. And what an opportunity we have as a people to return thanks to this amazing God for all the many ways that he provides or the many ways that you're looking for him to provide. He promises to show up. Um, Today, we are going to take a look um, at a destination down by the river. Are you ready? It's an unexpected destination for Paul. He wasn't planning on going down to the river and finding what he did, but I want you to know that um, there's three things that we're going to learn as we go down by the river. No temple? That's no problem. Worshiping God does not equal that you're saved. And once you're saved, there's a generous aftermath. So those are the three things we're going to look at. But I need your help for a second here. How many of you have an iPhone? Do you guys have an iPhone? Good, good, good for all of you. And uh, I bet you pick out that iPhone a lot, not just for texting or for calls. You take out your iPhone and you um, look at it to get to your destination. And uh, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to take a look at this destination. Father, thanks for this day that we have to worship you in spirit and in truth. And would you use this passage of scripture to wash over us, as sometimes we feel like there's an unexpected path that we're going to travel, an unexpected destination that we couldn't see. Maybe there's some roadblocks, maybe there's some detours, but Lord, we are trusting in you Lord, help us to see what we need today to bring more honor and glory to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So think about it. You get your iPhone out and you put in the destination and sometimes it gives you multiple routes, right? How many of you have had that before? And you're like, how does it pick that out so fast? But you do and you say, okay, I'll take this one. No tolls, uh, no troubles, this one. And you start to go and then what does it do? Sometimes it reroutes you. And uh, I'm not the navigator in the car, I'm just a driver. And so uh, I'm behind the wheel and oftentimes Sherry will say, oh, um, do you trust the ways? And I'm like, what does that mean? Well, it, it means that there's a route that it's chosen that's a little different than what we normally would go on this destination trip. So do you trust the ways? And I'm like, Okay, I'll trust, and you know, um, to be honest with you, it's pretty amazing how the algorithms work and it's, I don't know, it's avoiding a crash, it's avoiding avoiding something on the road and you get to your destination and you're thankful for like, okay, I trusted that uh, little thing that we have in our hand. Paul didn't have that in a day. Paul had uh, something a little different he had an opportunity to travel all around to represent the Lord in different towns. And as he was traveling, he would just go on this trip real time. But he had some times when he got rerouted. Last week, we looked at a couple of those. And um, one of those places that he got rerouted to sent him to another place that he got rerouted to, and then another place that he got rerouted to. And it said the reason why he was rerouted was because the Lord prevented him 
from going to those places. Now, when the Lord prevents us from something, sometimes that can be a little bit discouraging. Paul, who's trying to be the missionary, trying to be the one who is sent out from God to a destination to proclaim the truth of the gospel, the Lord shuts down the place where he's going. He went to several different places, and I am sure Paul, even though he's a strong man in his faith, even though he's a strong man in his character, he's a strong man in his personality. I am sure he was a little down. He was a little discouraged. We traveled a lot of miles to only be shut down. And if we're honest with each other, sometimes when we get rerouted, we can be discouraged, but we keep moving ahead. And so we're going to see a new destination that Paul is going to go to today, and it's a way different route than what he had traveled before. But uh, we're going to, if you haven't gotten there, find Acts chapter 16, and uh, we're going to take a look at where Paul is going to end up uh, on this day. Roman, or uh, uh, Acts chapter 16, verse 8. Let's try this TV out here. So I think Pastor Jeff likes this TV, and uh, I think he doesn't use his finger on this because it's going to leave grease marks. So when he comes back next week, there'll be a couple grease marks here. So um, here's the route that he traveled last week and got totally shut down. It's all in this region here. Bithynia and all these places he traveled, and the Lord said, no. And it's what we do when the unexpected no comes that we get to watch Paul respond in a way of obedience. All right, so here's what happens in um, Acts 16, verse 8. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas. Okay, so this is where they end up. Mysia, Troas, right by a huge body of water. And a vision appeared to Paul. And some of you have to be saying, a vision. Ah, that's kind of strange. Um, I don't know how many of us have had a vision, and that's the place that you're going to go to. But Paul has a vision on this day that there's a man of Macedonia standing there, urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia to help us. So he's got this vision. My next destination is Macedonia. He probably got out his iPhone on that day, and he's in Troas, and he looks at it, and he sees that destination is not to the east, it's to the west. And if you take a look at this map here, um, here's Troas, and he's got to go northwest. So how do you think he's going to travel? Helicopter? Airplane? Not there yet. He's got to travel by boat. And you know about their boats, right? They're not even like ours today. They're not motorboats. They're not, there are small boats that he's got to travel from here all the way to here. That's a long ways. But you know, he's not the first person um, to respond like this. He responded by immediately saying, I will go wherever you want me to go. When you look at this, and when Paul had this, seen this vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia. Immediately. How quick is immediately? Right away. No hesitation. He's not the first guy who's ever responded to the Lord in this way, and I want us to be encouraged by this. And he won't be the last, because God's going to press on your heart to go and do something for him. And he's asking us to have the same response. He's asking us to be a people who respond like Paul did. Do you remember way back in the book of Genesis, Abram, the Lord came to Abram and he said, I want you to leave the place that you're living and I want you to go. And he doesn't even tell them where. So he packs up his family. He leaves what's familiar and he goes to a place that he doesn't know because he knows that the Lord is asking him to go. I love the fact that he did that. Moses, when he was uh, given an opportunity to go out for the Lord, he at first had some like, I don't know, Lord, me? You're choosing me? Like, I am not sure I'm capable. I'm not sure I can speak well. And he's like, you, Moses. And he went and he led the people. He led an entire nation for the Lord. And he continued to go through the Old Testament. There's prophets 
who the Lord spoke to the prophets and he's like, I want you to proclaim this, I want you to herald this. And they're like, yes, even though it's hard, yes. Some said no, but then returned and then heralded the truth. And you think about the disciples and when, the, when, when Jesus spoke to them, they responded, I will go. And Paul on this day has an opportunity to either immediately go or to hesitate. And he responds like so many others, he immediately goes to Macedonia. Concluding, the reason? Well, he's going to there to preach the gospel. Paul is someone who I am sure, uh, when given the opportunity, where does he go? He goes to the synagogue and he gets up there and he preaches the gospel to the Jew first. Why? Because he wants them to hear the gospel that they might be saved. And so he's looking at this and like there's this Macedonian man who's calling out for help. Um, Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to go. He immediately gets up and he goes. Well, back to our map. They leave this place called Troas and they set sail to go all the way to Philippi. It is 150 miles. What's interesting about this text, it says that they had two stops along the way. One of them, they go from Troas to Samothrace. Samothrace is just a little island. It's mountainous, and it's got what I learned was there's some different forms of worship of false gods. They don't stick around there, but they made it there a day, and then from Samothrace, they made it all the way to their new continent. They get to Europe. They've only been in this continent. Now they get to a whole new place. They land in Neapolis. And then they walk from Neapolis to Philippi, which is a 10-mile walk. I think the Lord shows us this little passage for a couple reasons. Sometimes it's easy just to pass over these destinations. But later in Acts, in Acts chapter 20, verse 6, it said that it took them five days to return. So I think what happened on this trip, this trip only took them two days. That's an amazingly quick trip all the way across the sea to get to their destination. And sometimes I think when we find ourselves in a place where we're wondering, like, Lord, what is it that you're doing right now? Why am I going this way? Remember this, I love the way that the Lord provided because of their obedience. He provided for them in a way at the sea by like not having any obstacles this time. They had already overcome so many obstacles. He's like, I am just gonna put wind in their sail. I want them to get to their destination. I want them to see and to know that I am with them in this. So no choppy waters are mentioned, no blustery winds, no problems with the boat, just a strong wind in their sails to get them from Troas all the way to Neapolis in two days. That's amazing. So they end up at this city after they take this quick little walk, which I'm sure wasn't quick, and uh, they get to, oops, um, they set sail, they get to Neapolis, and they get to this town called Philippi. So what I want you to know about Philippi is it was a pretty cool town. It was a town where uh, the Romans soldiers, when they were done, they were retiring, most often they would go to Philippi. So when you're done with Rome and serving there, you would retire in Philippi. It was a happening place. There was a lot going on. There was industry. There was people setting up shop there. And um, it was kind of like the Rome away from Rome. And so when you're away from Rome, you do as the Romans do, and they just lived a, a really good life. And uh, it's kind of like if you live here in Chicago, and then you retire, and you go to either Florida or Arizona, and you go to a Coyotes game in Arizona, and you walk into the stadium because you want to go see the Chicago Blackhawks. And you think, man, I'm going to be one of the only ones in that stadium uh, but it's, you're, it's Rome away from Rome. It's Chicago away from Chicago. You walk into the stadium and 90% of the jerseys in the stadium are red, representing the Chicago Blackhawks. And the home team comes out and they boo them and the Blackhawks come out and they cheer for them. 
That's what uh, Philippi was like. It was full of Romans, and they, they were familiar. They even had some of their tax relief for them to go there. There was uh, benefits to going to Philippi. That's Paul's destination on this day in Europe, and he's going to be the one who's going to preach the gospel. Who's he looking for? The man in the vision that was calling out to him and with urgency, come, we need help. And that's what he's going, and that's what he's going to try to find. And when we have the unexpected show up in our lives, we need to look for, um, God, what is it that you have for me to do on this day when the unexpected come? So I want you to write this down. Our first point, and going down to the river, when a disciple of Jesus is on mission, you understand this, no temple, no problem. No temple, no problem. This passage here, so setting sail from Troas, they get to Philippi, which is the leading city in the district of Macedonian colony. Let's see if I can figure this out. Here we are. We remained in the city some days, and on the Sabbath day, we went outside, the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside. Where's he going? He's going to the synagogue because on the first week that Paul shows up somewhere, that first Sabbath, he goes there to preach the gospel. And so that's what he's going down to. On this day, he goes on the Sabbath day outside the gate to the riverside with expectation that what he is going to find is a synagogue where we were supposed there was a place of prayer. It wasn't there. Another unexpected. Can you imagine? He gets his GPS out. Okay. <laughs> really? Again? I come all this way. I believe you had a vision for me to go here to preach the gospel. I come to this Macedonian countryside, city, thriving city, only to find that there's no synagogue? Sometimes we have to alter our mindset. And I love the way Paul changes his mindset. No temple, no problem. He sat down and he spoke to the woman who had come together. That's an unexpected curveball that Paul has thrown his way he is wondering, okay, Lord, I came here to preach. I saw a vision of a man, but now I'm sitting down with women. Paul went to the location to preach. Now he's going to change it up, and he's going to have a conversation. What I want you to know is Paul isn't going to change the message. He just alters the method. When we think about the opportunities we have every day, and we think about the appointments that, the, that we have on our calendars, and we're going about something, some of our plans get changed. And the Lord might be the one who is changing some of those plans, and we get an opportunity to take a look at that and either be frustrated, discouraged, down, doubtful, or we can say, okay, Lord, I'll look at this as a divine appointment from you. What is it that you have me to do with this? On this day, he believed he was going to preach the gospel, but he sent uh, something very different. He sent some women who were down by the river, sitting together, and they were joining in prayer. And um, what does he do with all that? One heard us and was a woman named Lydia. And Lydia is from the city of Thyatira. She's a seller of purple goods. I saw some of you come in purple today. Maybe you're related to her. But she is someone who is um, very wealthy. She's a businesswoman. She's made uh, herself uh, a pretty good business. She has a place in Thyatira, and she has a place in Philippi, and she has set up shop and she is there for a period of time because it says her household is there. And so she is um, a seller of purple. 
Thyatira was the place that had the dye and they would, and it was a very wealthy, it was a royalty, and she was a provider of many people who were wearing purple dye, purple clothing, purple whatever. Uh, she was one of the salespeople of that. Lydia, she was someone who was uh, a businesswoman. She was someone who was probably uh, known in the community. And uh, she is someone who is, it says in a, in a moment here, that she is a worshiper of the Lord. So the first point we saw is no temple, no problem. I'll change my method because the message is so important. But what you'll see happen is he has this conversation with these ladies and something happens in the conversation that changes her heart. And what changes her heart is the Lord. But what I want you to see about her more than she's a business person that's done really well and she has a branch in uh, Philippi and in Thyatira, more than what she's able to accomplish in a given day, she is someone who is a worshiper of God. She's someone, the Moody Commentary says this about uh, her and a worshiper of God. It says that uh, she's a Gentile who believed in God following the moral and ethical teachings of Judaism, but was not a full convert. So why Paul? Why that day? Why her? Why these ladies? An interruption seemingly into the schedule, into the designated plan of going to the synagogue? Well, Paul's on mission. He learns that worshiping God does not equal being saved. He's having this conversation, and she is a worshiper of God, but she's not saved. Can you imagine Paul in this day? I don't know. I don't picture him being a guy who gets into much small talk. You know, if I'm with Joe Sabatino and we're playing golf, we're talking small talk for a while, and then he hits an amazing drive, and we're back on to like, we got to talk about the main thing. And when you think about Paul, he is all about the main thing, but he's got a new method. He's got to sit down and have a conversation with these ladies. He takes the conversation from small talk to probably about the gospel because he finds out that she's a worshiper of God, but he also finds out that she doesn't know Jesus. She keeps the law. She keeps the rules. That's not much different than what we see around in our day today. But I believe she was seeking truth, so God heard that she was seeking truth, and he sent Paul from Troas all the way over there for him to be able to share the gospel because she was a seeker of truth. How many people do you know that are seeking truth? Or how many people do you know that are worshipers and they would consider themselves saved because they worship? Going to church doesn't make you a Christian. I wrote a couple things down here. Believing that there is a God doesn't make you a Christian. There's people who say, I believe in God, but that God has many different names. It doesn't make them a Christian. Believing Jesus died on the cross doesn't make you a Christian because you believe in the historical event that Jesus went to the cross and he died. Believing that you have this amazing spiritual pedigree. I was born into a Catholic home. I was born into a Jewish home. I was born this way, therefore I am a Christian. That doesn't make you a Christian. Believing that all roads lead to heaven doesn't make you a Christian. Believing that loving God a loving God wouldn't send anybody to hell. That isn't true, and it doesn't mean you're a Christian. Demons believe that there's a Jesus in James chapter 2, verse 19, and it says they tremble. But the Bible says this, and this is what I believe he is there to tell her on this day. And it's what we will have the opportunity to tell with those that we have opportunity to speak with, maybe even this week, that are family, that are friends, that are coworkers. Listen, the message of truth is this. There's one God and one way to God. It's through Jesus. There's nothing that we do, but it's all that he has done for us. He chose us before the foundation of the world. He doesn't need us for a relationship or to complete him. 
We were actually born enemies of God, and it's because of sin God had to do something about it. He provides salvation through believing in his son Jesus, surrendering and putting our complete faith and trust in Jesus. On this day, Paul doesn't change the message of hope, but he's having a conversation with these ladies, and it said, in that conversation, the Lord opened her heart. She understood for the very first time, it wasn't about what she brought, but it was about what he's done. Can I tell you, really recently, someone came up to me and said, I have been a worshiper, but I didn't know Jesus until I understood it was what he's done, not what I bring. So I'm just flat out asking you today, has there been a point in your life when you understood that it's about what Jesus did for you in providing the gift, the free gift of salvation. This was her awakening, her spiritual awakening. Lydia, who was known for all these amazing things that she could accomplish in life, but, and she even thought that being a worshiper of God was a great accolade, but on this day, her life was totally changed. She went from being a worshiper, believing that equal being like relationship with God to understanding Paul's message of the hope of Jesus. And now she's a follower of Jesus. That's awesome. That's worth the Apple Maps taking you to a destination that you didn't see coming. That's Great when you open up and think, but I'm at the place where I'm supposed to be, and I think I'm supposed to preach in the synagogue, but it's not there, and I'm just, I'm with these people right now. Lord, what do you have me to share with them? This lady was listening in, and by the end of the discussion, she's someone who gives her life to Christ. That's amazing. So think about this for a second. We've got, um, we've got a big day coming up this week, Thanksgiving. How many of you are celebrating it with some type of family or friends? Lots of us. Maybe this little diagram will help bring some clarity and maybe bring some urgency to us in taking opportunities during the unexpected twists and turns that might come our way in life. I'd like you to take a look at this little diagram here. And I want us to try to figure out a number for each one of these little quadrants. You have a family and friends, you said, coming together this week to spend some time probably around the big bird, right? And you eat around a table, but then you watch football and you're sitting around downstairs um, watching games, doing stuff together as a family. Some of you have family members that don't know Jesus. Some of you have friends that you hang around with that don't know Jesus. And what I really want us to think about is the impact that we can have over a course of time as we intentionally thinking about, God, when will these relationships get into an expected opportunity to share the gospel? And how many of them are there before us? Well, some of you would say, well, this number of family and friends that I know by name and know them by deep conversation, I know they don't know Jesus. Maybe there's five of them. Some of you have kids and you go to their activities and you're sitting in the stands and you're getting to know the people around and while there might be hundreds of people, you might know three, four, five, 10 or 15, but let's just keep it simple for math's sake. We'll say there's five people that you've engaged in a conversation with, you know their names and they know you but you haven't been able to take it off of the small talk and get it onto the gospel, put those names down and start praying for them. So right now we've already got 10 people that we know of that we could be praying for that the Lord alters our course in a way that we can end up and we can think about how is it that we can share the gospel with them. There might be some people, like one person who came in last night and we have a conversation with them and we know that they don't know Jesus. Hey, could we go out for some coffee? Could we have an opportunity to spend some time together? Could we, and you start setting up ways for intentional conversations to happen. Maybe there's five of them. Hobbies, you go to the gym, you 
have different hobbies that you have set up in your life that are regular and you know people that are there, maybe that's five. And you add all this up, you have school and work and people that you live by in your neighborhood, whether you live in a condo or a townhouse or you live in a, a, a little neighborhood, there's probably hundreds of people all around you, but maybe you know two or three people by name and they know you. Do they know Jesus? Because the point of this story today is that Paul, in the unexpected times, going down to the river, thinking he's going to preach the gospel, changes it to a conversation. He's in the conversation. He finds out that the lady is a worshiper of God, but not a follower of Jesus. And he gets the opportunity to share the gospel with her. His obedience, her crying out for, Lord, he responds to it. I believe that's providence that God put him in that place for that time so that she could hear. And there's some of these people who need to know the gospel and you might be the one who's uniquely planted in front of them to share the gospel. They might uniquely plant themselves in your living room and you might have an opportunity to share the gospel. If you were to add all this up, you have your number. If you had uh, 20 people that you could list off, these people don't know Jesus. And if there's 350 in this room, think of the gospel impact that we can have as we go out on mission over these next days, weeks, months, and years. I'm not a very good mathematician. I should probably get Stan up here. But I think that's 7,000 people 7,000 people that we, just here in this room, could have the opportunity to impact with the gospel. So that GPS that's guiding you all around. Think about that GPS and how it might guide you into these places to have conversation. Hopefully you don't have to go 150 miles, maybe, but maybe you do. Maybe you need to get on a plane and go to a destination because that's where a family member lives but I bet you there's a lot of people just around us who need to know Jesus. We think we've heard them talk about, but do they really know? Paul on this day was obedient. He was expectant that the Lord was gonna use him, that he wasn't having to be there and it was a time wasted, but it was a time that God really used. Well, I want you to see what happens to this um, lady after she gives her life to Christ. She becomes a follower of Jesus. She does not remain silent. Lydia is someone that like when she understood and she had her spiritual awakening of becoming a follower of Jesus, take a look at verse 15. It says, after that she was baptized and her household as well. You'll see that phrase used again in Acts chapter 16, verse 31, where it says, in their whole household. But this is the first time it's mentioned. Lydia becomes a follower of Jesus, and here's the aftermath. It's a generous aftermath of what we see in her life. That's our third point. Unexpected place, no temple, no problem. Conversation, It goes from religious to explaining what salvation really is. She gets saved. The generous aftermath is expressions of here's who Jesus is. She gets baptized. Her household gets baptized. And then she urged us and judged me to be faithful to the Lord. So she's like, come to my house and stay day. She's like, I want to take what the Lord has given to me, and I want that to be used for moving um, and encouraging and being a part of God's work on this day. She wants to be a proclaimer of the truth. I love that. And then she wants to take who she is and what she is about and what has been provided for her, and she wants to use that for God's glory. She's a generous woman. She's like, come over to my house and stay. And I'm sure they're like, no, 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 that's fine. She prevailed on them. She won. They came over. What you need to know about this 
is she was generous, she was hospitable, and she made her house available not just on this day, but later in this chapter and other places, you'll find that Lydia, her house was a place that believers came to. It was kind of like the place where they set up shop for the first time in Europe with the gospel. The encouragement to us, if we know Jesus as our savior, are we proclaiming that? Have we been baptized? Are we communicating the truth of God's good news to others? And then how are we serving the Lord? Thinking about the age to come, not just what's going on right here and now, but how can we as a people, how can we be who are uniquely planted, deeply rooted, carefully pruned, and persistently fruitful followers of Jesus be all in in the way that we give ourselves in a given day for the Lord, in a given week for the Lord, that the Lord has all of us and we understand that everything we have is his. That's what this passage is calling us to. It's calling us to be people who are responding to the Lord when the destination doesn't seem to make sense, will we immediately respond to what God asks us to do and will we give it everything we can for his glory? The Lord opened her heart. Before the foundations of the world, the Lord knew that she was going to be a follower of Jesus. But God chose Paul on that day to travel to this destination to be able to share the good news of the gospel. May that be an encouragement to us as we think about how we can move forward for Jesus. So let me pray for us right now. Dear Father in heaven, I am thankful that we can trust in your ways. Sometimes it seems very unique in the way that you've asked us to travel. Sometimes it seems very... Um, unplanned, unexpected. But Lord, I pray that you would just help us to be a people who are growing in our faith and growing in our courage. I pray that you would help us to be a people that are sensitive and looking for ways to be all about sharing the gospel, just like what Paul did. He altered his methods because it was necessary so that someone could understand who you were Father, would you help us as a church, would you help us as a people to be committed to your ways and your work and your timing and to be able to see that we can trust in you, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, that the path that you take us on is not a waste of time, it's not a misplaced journey, but an opportunity to look at those who are in front of us and to be able to be the hands and the feet of Jesus. And so Lord, use us as a people to bring you more glory. And it's in your great name that we pray, amen. We're gonna do something a little uh, different today in the way that we observe communion. We're actually gonna ask our communion team to come down and to be in your specific places. But we're gonna have uh, you at, at a time when you're dismissed from your row to come forward. You're all gonna exit to the right out of your row and you're gonna go to wherever the usher directs you to go, pick up your communion and go back to the left and sit back down. And what I want you to do when you go back and you sit down is maybe just spend a moment thinking about all that Jesus has done for you. Jesus who loved you. Jesus who gave of himself. He was put to death. He rose on the third day. He did this because he was the only one who could be the perfect sacrifice. So this is something that he's left for us as a church to remember, to observe, to be a people that are a grateful people for all that he has done. So um, I'm just gonna ask now that if uh, we could just pray and ask the Lord to use this time and then we're gonna sing together and you're gonna be dismissed from your rows up to the uh, place where communion's being served. Lord, use this time to touch our hearts. Use this time to remind us of your goodness and your mercy and your grace and your favor. Thank you for providing this gift of Jesus that we might be set free. And would you find us as a church today just in a place of readiness to express our gratitude for you. We love you. And thank you for the time that you've set aside for us 
to dwell on your goodness, to dwell on your mercy. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So when the usher comes by, if your row could stand up before he dismisses you, and then we'll just keep moving.
this day in Corinthians, Paul records some words here and it said, Jesus was with his disciples and he's asking them to remember him. And this is something that we as a church get to observe, those of us who are followers of Jesus. We get to remember what Jesus did. And so listen to these words here. It says, the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed, he took that bread. And when he had given thanks, they were sitting around this table. He said, uh, he broke the bread. This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So let's partake. And he looked around the table on that day and he said to them, um, in the same way, he took the cup after supper saying, this cup, it's the new covenant in my blood and do this as drink this in remembrance of me. And so they partook. As a church family, listen to these words, for as often as you eat the bread and you drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It's an observance for us as a church to be mindful of the amazing gift of Jesus and the gratefulness that we should have because he's the King of kings and the Lord of lords who gave himself that we might have life and be able to live it abundantly. So I'm just gonna pray and thank the Lord. Father, thank you for these quiet moments where you give us as a church an opportunity to say thank you. Thank you for the amazing gift of salvation. We don't take it for granted. Your grace, your mercy, your sacrifice, none of us deserve it, but we're thankful. We sit here today as a humble group of people wanting to now take this truth that we know and to be bold proclaimers of it because we've been set free. So help us to be able to take the baton like Paul did on that day of the gospel and shared it with Lydia and you opened her heart. Would you help us on this day see that we have the baton of the gospel with us and we can share that, that the news might spread deeper and wider and further. Use us, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.
Amen. That, we made a good decision today to come to church, to worship the Lord, King Jesus. I'm thankful that we got to do that today. And uh, if you've got something on your heart, maybe you want to praise the Lord or you want to have someone pray for you with a burden, uh, please come up and or we'll have leaders here to pray with you. If you're visiting and would like to say hello and meet, I would love to meet you. I'm going to go out to the welcome table. And uh, kind of a cool thing happening. Um, there's an opportunity through our church. Uh, some families in our church are involved with a ministry that serves orphans in Ghana. And so they've got an event coming in two weeks. If you're curious about that, it's particularly good for young families. Kind of a christmas theme way to be generous. And uh, that is out in the lobby. You can check that out today, all right? Uh, we have the opportunity in front of us to go out on mission for Jesus this week. As we do, remember, you are loved.